We're changing tapes. Uh, it's going to be just a second here. We're good? Okay. Uh, <laughs> this has pretty uh, been quite a day and uh, very um, emotional for me, especially now. Uh, uh, this guy's been very prominent in my life for quite a long time. And uh, he was the chair of my dissertation committee when uh, I started really working on this, this model and this framework. And it looked completely different and didn't have any uh, academic rigor attached to it. And um, uh, uh, he took me on as a student, and um, it took eight years. And that's uh, where where the SEER model came from. We called it uh, Mandala for the 21st century. But I was lucky enough for m many of those eight years to meet with uh, uh, Dr. Chiksemahai uh, on Mondays. Uh, almost every Monday and for for a long time, so it was it completely changed the trajectory and, and where I was going with my life and everything that I was doing so it 's very emotional that I uh, introduce him and uh, talk to him. The book that I want to introduce him with is from a this is one of my favorite books is how to get a life and it 's selected excerpts uh, from a lot of pretty uh, made people that you know uh, Emerson Doyle. Disney, um, Colin Powell, John Locke, Aristotle, Plato, Shakespeare, and Csikszentmihalyi. <laughs> um, so that's the company that we're we're keeping. Um, he, uh, um, Dr. Csikszentmihalyi. I just want to read this little excerpt at the beginning because I really like how they did it. At a, at age uh, 21, uh, Csikszentmihalyi interviewed several European who had been in prison under Stalin. In his conversation with these prisoners who managed to live through torture and incredible, incredible things, Csikszentmihalyi noticed that not only did some prisoners survive, they seemed to attain a transcendent kind of inner peace. He resolved to find out how a person could live a better life beyond the control of external events. He says, I wanted to find out how optimal states of being occurred and what people can do to bring them about. And um, so that's what he dedicated his life to. And at age 22, and he'll tell us more of the story, at age 22 he came to the States um, in, in Illinois uh, with a uh, dollar and 25 cents in his pocket. And um, uh, he, he uh, took a number of odd jobs, auditor, unsatisfying coursework, and he, and he started to, to really develop this work in creativity and peak experiences. Um, in the 90s, uh, Dr. Csikszentmihalyi's work started gaining really prominent worldwide attention. And uh, uh, Jimmy Johnson of Dallas Football, when they, when they won the Super Bowl, was using his book. And um, Phil Jackson, the guru, President Clinton, Prime Minister Tony Blair, Newt Gentrich, uh, they were all using the book and talking about it. And you know, there's, it's, you know, he's touched millions and millions and millions of people people with his many, many uh, uh, books and journal articles that he's written. And, and, and uh, when I came to Dr. Csikszentmihalyi's, uh, uh, I read Flow, and I really believed that it could happen in business. And he said, absolutely. And in fact, when I first met him personally, he, uh, Dr. Csikszentmihalyi was, was uh, researching a book called Good Work. And all day today, we've seen examples of good work, incredible companies, that have done amazing things, big companies, medium-sized companies, and small companies, by embedding their values and bringing this passion forward, being authentic, being real, talking about what they weren't as well as they, what they were. And uh, the first question I'd like to ask you, uh, Mike, is, is uh, you know, in your book, Flow and uh, Creativity and in Good Work, uh, what were, what were some of the common themes that you found in these businesses that, you know, is it, is it like what we saw today? Was it, is this a representative sample of what we've seen today? 
Um, you studied a lot more companies and your unit of analysis was much longer, wider. Your net was a lot wider. Um, what were the common themes and how did these organizations bring in creativity and flow? And maybe you can even talk about flow and, and give us a little overview of it. Okay, well, yeah, it's um, like, uh, first of all, let me say that he says he's uh, moved or whatever, feeling, but I am too because, I mean, rarely do you have the, uh, the privilege to be with a former student who is uh, doing good stuff like Michael is doing. In fact, they say that one of the things that Leonardo da Vinci, who was probably one of the most creative, if not the most creative person in Western history anyway. And, um, but he died without a successor, so to speak. And, um, no, no one that he, because he was a kind of strange person, uh, not a very extroverted. In fact, he was a very boring person, even though he was the most creative uh, uh, not only artists but scientists and everything. But anyway, he was when he was dying, he said um, something which could translate, I guess, uh, as unlucky is uh, the master who is not surpassed by his disciples. And I think that is truly um, an important issue: is to have, to feel that you have uh, not that you are not the end of the line, that there are better things to come in the future. And, and I think this evening, uh, what I have heard and what Chip was saying is um, confirmation of building on the kind of stuff that I believe in and that's important. But you asked, you know, how typical it is and uh, for good businesses to operate in this way. And I, I do think that I agree with Chip that the the um, tip of the pyramid is is meaning in a sense to be able to to um, add to the meaning of life of not only the people who work in the company but to the customers and sh uh, stakeholders of the company. And I think I think pretty much uh, all the companies I studied that could be considered doing good work have found a way uh, to um, represent something which is transformative um, either within the business, uh, the industry, but more than it, just the industry, but in, a, in the way in which people live together, the, the way that people strive to have a good life together. And that's, you know, that really is the bottom line. And, uh, and you find this kind of stuff often, uh, like Chip was mentioning, when things are at their worst. You know, when, when you feel that the meaning in li of the life that you accepted as a child doesn't work anymore, that there is some disconnect between what you learned or what you believed life to be like and what the realities are. And you suddenly feel that the rug is being pulled from under you and then that's what, uh, what when you have to face up to, okay, so what, what is really that um, one should prioritize in, in life and what, what is worth living for. You know? And that, I think, somehow, one way or the other, uh, good leaders, good business people have to, you know, come to that point, that crossing, that crisis where uh, they have to go one way or the other. Um, so, so, so how does that, how does that fit with you know, your, some of your, your, your early work that you're very well known for, flow. Um, can you just go over flow for, <laughs> and just, because we're talking about creativity and, yeah. um, and just maybe, you know, big C creativity. We've been talking about breaking paradigms all day. Wow. And some of our early speakers, Courtney and, and Tom, and, uh, you know, so they, they did things completely out of the box. 
I mean, and very much in a flow, but could you explain flow and where it came from and how you came about it and, yeah. and how do you define it? Well, I did my dissertation, my PhD uh, on creativity at the University of Chicago. And I was, uh, I thought that by studying artists, uh, visual artists, I could see the process of creativity uh, much better than if I studied mathematicians or physicists for, um, uh, whose process is all internal and hard to follow for somebody who doesn't know. So I, uh, my dissertation involved me uh, following artists for weeks and weeks in their studies, starting a painting, finishing it, and, and then interviewing about what happened moment by moment. And the, um, the thing that, that struck me most, in a way, was that uh, these people started out with a blank canvas and kind of studying a few moves, move, looking at what they did, uh, to, uh, red here, black there, and then beginning to connect the dots, so to speak, and create a work. And after they started, about a, an hour or two after the beginning of the process, they were so taken by what they were doing that they couldn't hear when you talk to them, they wouldn't um, Notice that it was getting dark, or or, or it was uh, lunchtime, or anything like this. Uh, at most, they would run to the bathroom and back, but that's about it. I, they were so focused on what they were doing, and and this went on for weeks. And then, um, when they finished the painting, you know, they looked at it uh, for a few minutes, and then they put it against the wall. And typically, they didn't look at it again. You know, it was uh, they were just ready to start another <laughs> painting. And this was so much contrary to what the uh, theories at that time and psychological theories w would say that you know, goal-directed behavior is what motivates us to act, and usually. Um, the action is motivated by some kind of reward or punishment, and uh, uh, that is what's about, that we are always motivated by reaching a goal at the end of our behavior, our, our process. And these people seemed clueless uh, of this important psychological theory. They weren't doing it that. They were doing something for the the pleasure or, or the enjoyment of doing of, of uh, doing something, which at the end didn't matter to them much. You know, once it finished, you put it on and you are ready to start a new one, a new new painting. So this this was um, a behavior that psychological theorists at that time could not really explain very well, and that got me then to say, okay, so what's going on? What is really, what is really rewarding about, uh, you know, painting? And then after I got some idea of that, I, I said, well, does it only occur with creative people, with uh, artists and so forth, or does it happen more in everyday life also to people who are not necessarily creative in, 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 or, or focused on creativity. And pretty soon you discover that, I mean pretty soon, after years of interviewing, observing, um, you know, I, I did find that in fact all you have to do is talk to average people who are doing normal jobs and you find that Almost in any job, there are people who are able to experience that same complete involvement in what they are doing, which feels so exciting and so rewarding that you want to do it. Even most people get also paid for it or recognized for it, but it's not necessary. The, the point is that you experience yourself expressing what you can do at its best. 
and, and that could be artistic, it could be athletic. I mean, sports are basically just excuses for people to try to do their best, you know, physically. And um, art is uh, the same thing, whether you are dancing or singing or playing an instrument, you are not doing it primarily unless you are really professional. You are not doing it for an external reason. You are doing it because as you are uh, playing the instrument or, or uh, um, dancing or whatever, you feel that your body, your mind, your skills are, are at their best. They are, you are expressing who you are, what you are to its fullest and that is enormously rewarding. Instead of just doing what you are told to do or what you are expected to do, you are doing what you want to do to its fullest. And if you are lucky, this is also your job. Because, for instance, when I started studying when I moved from athletes and, and artists to everyday occupations and I was wondering where to start, my friend said, oh, well, start with surgeons, because surgeons love what they do. And in fact, that was eye-opening to me. I, I would faint if I had to be a surgeon, but if you are a surgeon, you can get to the point that many of the People, for instance, we interviewed, um, uh, hadn't taken vacation for the first 15 years of their job and, uh, because they were so busy finishing their uh, uh, residency and, and this and that. And the first time they go on a, on a vacation with their spouse um, to Acapulco or somewhere, uh, they say, well, yeah, the first two days I tried to be on the beach and go in the water and read, but it was so boring that I had to volunteer in the local hospital to, <laughs> to do operations. Uh, and, that, and if you ask a surgeon to describe how it feels when they're operating, they, I, I bet you eight out of ten will give you an analogy from sports. It's like skiing, it's like sailing, it's like playing football. It's a body contact sport, they say. You know, they get all this, and you know, you, at first, as I say, this didn't make sense, but then as you begin to extract what is common, what people are saying, whether they are uh, artists, uh, sports people or, or surgeons, there are certain commonalities um, that in each of these activities you can discover and can, if they are right, if you are in the right condition in this activity, then you experience this complete involvement. And the conditions are simple. I mean, there are half a dozen, eight major conditions like um, there has to be very clear goals uh, to what you're doing. And the goal is not to get to the end of the thing, but the next step of the way. For instance, if you play, if you play the piano, you play a sonata, the, your goal is not to get to the end, you know. Uh, what's, what, what would be more silly to, than try to play a, a piece just so that you get to the end? The point is to have every chord, every moment you put your fingers on the keyboard should be perfect or close to perfect, you know, and that's the goal. And, and they just go one after the other. And if you play tennis, uh, you want to win, of course, sure, but you, the goal is not to win. The goal is to get the set and the game, the match, you know, every every time you hit the ball, you want it to go inside the area where it it, uh, it should go, and that having those clear goals focuses your attention in the activity. And the next thing is you have to get feedback. You have to see whether you're doing that or not. Like 
In tennis, you see, every time you hit the ball, it goes in or out. And that keeps you focused. And in, if you're playing an instrument, you can hear whether you are doing the right note or, or, or not. And so the f goals, feedback, and the, the f perhaps the most important thing is that you find the ability to balance your uh, skills with the uh, opportunities or challenges in the environment. Because if there's too much challenge, you begin to feel stress and you feel anxious. There are too few challenges, you feel bored and finally apathetic or, or nothing. Right. So this clear goals, feedback, matching challenges and skills is the general context in which these experience of complete involvement can occur. And once you are in that condition, you feel uh, increasingly focused and become effort. Uh, you, are, you can be doing something very difficult intellectually or physically, but it feels effortless. You, are, you lose yourself in the activity. You lose your feeling of who you are. You feel uh, you lose uh, the sense of time, Our hours seem to go by, uh, even though it's, um, to you it seems like there are only minutes. But, but so, and all of these, uh, this kind of gestalt of experiences is what eventually I, I ended up calling flow because so many of the people were whom I, we interviewed were saying, oh, it feels like being carried by a current. It, it, it feels like effortless and, and just uh, um, just so um, focused and, and moving by itself. And OK, so we had a name for it, Flow. And then, you know, for the past, uh, 35, 40 years I've been studying it, how it manifests itself in different situations, what it takes, and, and uh, how it can. I, I have never been trying to apply it to myself, to, but interestingly, a lot of businesses and a lot of, uh, as you say, you know, political uh, heads of state, like, you get. One of the people who asked me to go and talk to him, for instance, was the um, a president of a uh, European country that used to be very, very powerful and very, very uh, important culturally and everything else. But now it's going kind of downhill, and, and uh, I didn't know why he wanted to talk, but we had long talks. and. Uh, basically, what he said was, you know, um, we used to be a great country, but now um, we have become a very boring place. And, uh, and all the young people who have energy and imagination move somewhere else. Uh, and we are, losing, we are losing the kind of... Uh, minds the kind of brain power that uh, made us great ones. And what could we do? I mean, it's interesting issues, uh, interesting issues, uh, interesting uh, both in the business world, those who are trying to, to uh, apply it um, have had in very nice stories to tell me, although I'm not I'm not involved in those applications, but um, it's good to know that it it is a, an idea or a theory and that has uh, really important practical applications. One great um, American psychologist used to say that uh, there is nothing more practical than a good theory. and um, that's something that I kind of have felt that it's, it may be true because uh, it's, it's lovely to see how, 
how people can use it and, and apply it in their life. That's, thank you. That, that, so that I think I think what I heard you say is that um, um, sometimes you use this term autotelic, so yes. self-motivated, yeah. intrinsic yeah. motivation, yeah. self goal, tell it, yeah. tell us. Yeah. I hear you say that. So, um, what about for those of us that that you know, for some people that you know, they may not be in a you say in an optimal state, your, your, your work is something that you can get into this space, into this zone, into this flow. Um, what if you're, you're doing a job that, that you, can you do it in any job? I guess that's my question. Is it any activity, is it possible to get into it? Yeah. So first, and then kind of follow up is, are we all creative? Is everybody creative, it's just not developed uh, or? Yeah, I, I should say that uh, um, yeah, I have a rather uh, different view of creativity than of flow. I think flow, everybody can enter that state. If um, Creativity, uh, well, you mentioned big C creativity. Um, I think small C creativity, yes, that's open to everyone. But if you think that by being in flow, you are going to become famous and get a Nobel Prize, that's not, it doesn't follow because creativity is a social, socially, um, it's based on the social acceptance and valuation of what you do. Flow is your own business, you know, that, that you are doing it, you feel it, you, and if you are into it, nobody can take it away from you. But big C creativity is, uh, you, flow is necessary to be creative, I, I think, because um, in my work with later, I work, I interviewed 91 very creative people and wrote a book on that, and 14 of them were Nobel Prize winners, and they all had flow in their work. I mean, no, but it doesn't work the other way. In other words, just because you have flow doesn't mean you will be creative. So, um, with big C. So but just for edi edification, so if I understand it correctly, uh, big C creativity is when you're actually changing a paradigm, and you're you're yeah. you're really doing something that's never been done before. Is that correct? Yeah, or uh, that's the highest form. But it should be at least uh, big C creativity is usually defined as um, and action or product or idea which is statistically improbable and then you have to decide how improbable where do you want to make the line but it should be improbable to a certain extent and second that it's carried to fruition that is that it's not just an idea and then forget it but developed to its until you can be used it can be used okay and the third one is that it should be socially valued. That's how it's usually uh, defined. And again, socially valued is, is a very elastic notion because when Einstein developed the theory of creativity, uh, you saw his picture, Chip Shulman, um, he apparently only four people in the world understood you know, but those four people were the heads of departments of physics in Germany, England, and Cambridge University, and Berlin University, and so on. And they say, oh yeah, this may actually work. And it was enough for four people to, validate. to then validate it. Whereas, for instance, for a mass product, you need millions of people to accept it as a valid alternative. For instance, when Coke uh, started a new Coke in the 70s, you know, they spent so much time researching and focus groups and so forth. Everybody said, yeah, this is a great idea, but then it fizzled out within weeks and it was already cold and the old Coke came back. So that's a mass product where you need the whole society <laughs> to validate it. But in some f fields like physics, all you need is to convince the top of the 
hierarchy of, uh, of scientists, and if they say it's okay, it filters down, and then people say, yeah, he's a great thinker, even though you don't understand what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, the, so, so taking it, um, uh, something you said a little bit earlier, you said that, that if you're, again, if you're lucky enough to have it in your work, uh, do, do most flow, exper I would think flow experiences are more, more on, in your leisure time, when you're off, on your weekend, but I've heard you say before that that's not actually true. Yeah, generally, I mean, in our studies, we find that um, people tend to reach this flow experience more often at work um, than in their free time, where there are no clear goals what to do when you go home, unless you, you have built kind of goals in the routine of your life or the family life so that you can do things that make sense and uh, to everybody and that have uh, feedback, pr provides feedback. But at home, mostly you don't, you relax, you recharge. If you are lucky, you have a, uh, you can have flow with your family members in conversation. Conversation is a great, great flow, vehicle for flow, uh, but Basically, most people think that home life will automatically be happy or, or relax, and, and so you, you don't try to think of it as, as something that you have to work on. And yet, unfortunately, if you don't work on it in the sense of uh, organizing your activities, your thoughts, your interactions in ways that are good for everybody, then it, it, it's not going to work out. And uh, so anyway, the, the point, I think you raised that question before, and I didn't answer it, but it's true that flow depends uh, on both on the individual's ability to discover goals and read the feedback, but it also depends um, equally, uh, not equally, but um, uh, the other component is the environment in which you find yourself. For instance, if your job is um, such that you don't really, you can't tell what when you do well or not, uh, that you don't get feedback from uh, either your boss or your own activity, and and you the the challenge skill ratio is out of balance then it's hard to much harder to get to be in flow but you know one of the best examples of flow for instance um, good morning america which is this abc show i don't know if it's still there but um, uh, somebody called me up from it 15 20 years ago and said, we would like to have a little segment on flow, and uh, they asked me to give them the name of people whom I studied who, who would be good example. And I said, no, I don't like to do that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, this is kind of confidential my, uh, when I work with people, so you, um, you should find it yourself, and it's not difficult. And the producer was Oh no, but it would take us days and days. I said, no, just go down to Rockefeller Center, they are up in the 20th floor there or something, and, and talk to people, just stop them and ask them, do you like your job? And if they say yes, you ask them to describe it. And she said, oh, but that wouldn't work. And um, finally she said, well, okay, okay. And she goes back about a few days later and say, you know, we have some wonderful examples, and uh, she was all excited, and I said, yeah, I, I'm not surprised. So the first, when you saw this segment, which is only four minutes or so, the first guy was um, a person whose job consisted in slicing salmon to make lo uh, lox and bagel sandwiches for a delicatessen in Manhattan. and. 
all he did from four in the morning till um, sometime like two in the afternoon, I don't remember, all he did was slice fish, you know, as, you know. And when he talked to the reporter who asked uh, to describe his job, he sounded like any of the artists that I had studied before. I mean, as he said, you know, I come in at four o'clock and by then there are five big salmons waiting for me laid out um, and that have been brought in at, at night. And I take the first one and I s let it drop on my marble top uh, where I uh, do my cutting. And I listen and I look at the vibration on the, on the skin of the fish. He used simpler terminology, but that's what he was saying. Okay, I look at this fish and I, I keep doing this, dropping it until I have developed a three-dimensional x-ray of how this fish is made. Because he says every fish is different. And I just want to make sure I know how this fish is. And then I take one of these uh, five knives that I constantly sharpen during the day, and I start cutting it. And I want to cut it so that I make the thinnest slices uh, with uh, wasting the least amount of meat. Uh, using the fewest movements and and not getting tired by the end of the day. So these were his four criteria for a good job. You know, nobody told. Well, maybe he was told that at least the first or second thing from his when he started this thing. But then he developed this. This is my. Yeah, this is how I want to cut. And he says, I do this, and every fish is different, so I have to adapt myself to the way this fish is. And, so. and when I go home, I feel proud and satisfied because I did my best. You know, I mean, so this guy, uh, I don't know, it's pretty unique to find a, a person like that. Yeah. Wow, that's great. But you know, I, I talk to assembly line workers, I talk to all kinds of people who you would never believe that they had any kind of control over the job or any kind of, uh, you know, uh, yeah. vision as to what they wanted to come. So it's possible to do it, you know. And this is, you know, uh, on the continuum with what Chip was uh, when he, you showed uh, Victor Frankl, uh, you know, and when you read his um, Man's Search for Meaning, you find that partly that's how he survived, by uh, using some of the, he developed his own survival criteria for how to have a good life, good, you know, in the misery and terror of a concentration camp. I get emotional about him because my older brother, who married one of Frankel's great great grand uh, uncle uh, nieces, <laughs> yeah. So he was uh, kind of related to to his family, but he, uh, yeah, he was uh, someone who was able in the. Uh, you know, uh, this kind of, in the midst of constant death and sickness and horror, to kind of carve out uh, a little moments of decency in his, in the way he helped other people and the way he uh, enjoyed the memories of his life before and and. He thought about his wife and how, what will happen when they would be reunited. He he didn't dwell on the fact that probably he wouldn't be reunited because most people died there. But he he thought, well, you know, 
Um, I tried to do my best, prepare myself for a good life for later on. And, and again, it's, it's hard to summarize it. But the, the basic point is that in, um, our ability to experience life is very limited. Uh, so that, for instance, um, neuro, uh, neuropsychologists who study these things come with different, slightly different numbers. but. The basic thing is that you can have about 119 plus or minus 10 data points that you can process at any in a second, OK? Um, for instance, to listen to me to speak, you have um, to process 60 bits of information to understand what I'm saying just to understand what I'm saying, 60 bits. Uh, if you want to really understand it and connect it to your memories and, and put it in context of your knowledge, already existing knowledge, you need a lot more bits of information. But your upper limit is 119 bits per second, roughly. So, that's why you can't understand more than two people talking to you. Even even just if we are talking about the weather and two people are talking to you at the same time, you can kind of process it. But you can't understand three people. Three people talking to you, it's already over the limits of your, of what we, our brain can systematic or understand or, or make sense of. So this, um, this is the limitation. Um, and any, everything that we want to do requires attention. And so we have 119 things we can process in a second. Part of it is somebody talking, part of it is what we are thinking, partly feeling where we are sitting, and, and that may introduce, you know, that's part of it. It's the kinesthetic processing of internal states, headache, hunger. All of these compete for this very limited amount of what I call psychic energy, because uh, psychic energy is what we need to make any kind of conscious ac action. And we, at the end of life, and this is something actually that William James, the first great American psychologist uh, over 100 years ago, have written about this, that at the end of life, we're looking back and ask ourselves, what, what was this about? You know, what was our life about? It's the sum of these seconds that we have, in which we have processed bits of information surround you. So if all you are thinking about all the time is food, which some people actually do mostly, at the end of your life, uh, that's all you had is food, uh, you know, uh, memories of food, but which have already blended into kind of a, there's nothing else to remember. There is nothing else that you can claim to have done in life. So. The, what William James said 100 years ago, and I, it's been forgotten, and, and, uh, is that, in a sense, we are constructing our lives by allocating attention differentially to what has, what's around us. And again, what Chip was saying um, that Maslow picked up uh, on is that, you know, there is a gap between uh, stimulus and response, and that gap is where our freedom is. And our freedom consists partly in not paying attention to this thing, not paying attention to that thing, but paying attention to this thing. And that, that is what shapes your life. That's what your life will be. And, uh, it's, 